introduce uh, our next speaker here today. First off, I do want to thank Paul Levy. That was an incredible speech and um, so many great talking points. So um, I, I have this pleasure and distinct honor of uh, introducing um, a female physician that I am in awe of and inspired by your work every day. So I'm here to introduce our COIL lecturer, Dr. Lena Wen. She's an emergency physician by training, public health leader, and passionate public advocate uh, for patient-centered healthcare reform. As the author of the critically acclaimed book, When Doctors Don't Listen, her TED Talk on medicine has been viewed nearly two million times. And in 2019, Dr. Wen was named Time's Most 100 Influential People. And then GW was able to have her join the team as a visiting professor of health policy and management here, which is uh, such an honor as a distinguished fellow uh, um, uh, at the Institute of Health Workforce Equity and your previous work as the president and CEO of Planned Parenthood Federation of America as that first physician to lead Planned Parenthood here in nearly 50 years. You work to expand comprehensive health care for vulnerable women and families and for that I know so many people are appreciative of that work. Serving as the health commissioner in the city of Baltimore, where she led the nation's oldest continuously operating health system in the United States to fight the opi opioid epidemic, treat violence and racism as public health issues, and improve maternal and child health. I think as a great segue into your talk today, what we heard earlier on the impact of public health, and this is the great opportunity for our country and this industry to really focus. I'm so excited to hear you speak here today, and please join me in welcoming Dr. Lena Wen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, and thank you, Kelly, for that very kind welcome. Can I ask you all to join me also for a round of applause to the president of the MHA Alumni Association, Kelly Laura. <laughs> now to the current students and faculty and staff of the MHA program who are here today, thank you for inviting me, welcome, and I thank you for your dedication to learning and teaching in this critically important field. And to the alumni, so show me who are the alumni who are here today? Wow, there are quite a lot of you, so welcome back. It's an immense privilege to also be learning about your work and your commitment to improving healthcare in your various roles, including some of you I see who I know from my work previously in Baltimore as well. Um, now, I know that the Masters of Health Administration here at GW does just incredible work to train future leaders. And all of you who have passed through this program have received exceptional education to become a transformational leader within healthcare. And you understand the intersection, I think the intersection that our last speaker, Paul Levy, spoke so well about, this intersection of healthcare, policy, administration, and public health. And I think you believe, as I do, that healthcare has to be a right that is guaranteed to all, not just a privilege that's available only to some. And you know, too, that our work serves a purpose that's much bigger than any one of us sitting in this room right now. And it's actually written into the mission of your program to train the next generation of leaders in the healthcare industry to improve health and health systems on a local, national, and global scale. And so may I ask that the director of the MHA program, Dr. Bob Bona, the director of the executive MHA program, Dr. Len Freeman, to please be, to please rise and also be acknowledged for your exemplary leadership here. Now I have one more round of thanks, if you all indulge me for a moment, which is that the form um, the fact that the work of the MHA program would not be possible without the involvement and support of extraordinary leaders at the Milken Institute of School of Public Health, some of whom are, have been here today. I know that Dean Lynn Goldman was here, Professor Zoe Beckerman, and now I see Professor Jane Thorpe here too. We thank you so much for your leadership and support. Now today, I am deeply honored to be delivering the 13th annual, lucky 13th, Lucky 13th Annual Coyle Lecture, Coyle Lecture, named to honor Russell C. Coyle Jr., whom I've been learning more about and has a really interesting career. So you all know 
because it's written in your programs, that Russell Coyle Jr. was a renowned consultant and author who received his MHA here from GW. He was a trusted advisor to physician groups, to hospitals, to health plans around the country, and he authored several books addressing a whole variety of topics like the aging of the American population, electronic health records, the rise of managed care, I mean, topics that are as important and topical now as ever. And I also found it really inspiring that Coyle remained utterly dedicated to his mission, continuing to give speeches and writing until two weeks before his passing. And as I researched for today's lectureship, one particular theme stood out. Russell Coyle Jr. was known first and foremost as a visionary and as a futurist, which I have to say maybe I'm not so much of a futurist that I had to look up what is a futurist, but you know, I, I found it really interesting that he was recognized in his time and now as an expert in anticipating trends and developments in healthcare. And he published this monthly newsletter way before everybody had their own newsletter and podcast and social media and whatever, but he had his own newsletter, Russ Quell's Health Trends, that was dedicated to the latest trends within the industry. So looking at telemedicine, to new payment models under Medicare and Medicaid. But I also learned that Coyle's futurism was not just limited to his research and to his professional expertise. Because it was part of his life's vision to not just improve lives today, but also look into how we can be creating an even better tomorrow. So in our world of evolving healthcare policies and health crises, I think we can all aspire to be visionaries, like the visionary whose lecture um, this is named after. Because I think being a visionary requires us to realize that all the work that we do every day, whether we are studying to get there, or whether we're actually delivering the work to lead a hospital system, or um, to work in a government, or to operating a clinic, that all of this will intersect in a key way. And all of this is for that higher goal, because our North Star always has to be service to our patients and our communities. And I also think that in today's environment, being a visionary requires us to be brave. Because frankly, there are a lot of injustices that stand in the way of healthcare access and equity, all these things that we hold to be, uh, to be critical. And I think it requires us to recognize when and where our voices are most needed and where we will have that greatest impact. So I was glad to follow um, Paul Levy and to hear the conversation also about public health because I come to you today from that world, from the world of public health, which I hope that you're right, that public health can be a way for us to bridge different gaps and to, and to come together to a new place. And actually, I'll be quoting my hero um, and mentor, Congressman Elijah Cummings, quite a lot um, in, this, in this conversation today. But um, one thing that Congressman Cummings likes to say to this point is he says, he passed away recently, as many of you know, but he used to say that um, we should not just be aiming for common ground, we should be looking for higher ground. And I do wonder, I hope that public health can be a way for us to look for that higher ground together. But we are a long way off from that. And I come to you today, as you know, from the city of Baltimore, where a child born today can expect to live 65 years or 85 years. A 20 year difference in life expectancy based solely on the zip code and the neighborhood that he or she just happens to be born into. And there is huge unmet need all throughout our city, no matter where you look, in areas of addiction and mental health, which you know, really should be regarded no differently than any other aspect of healthcare. Um, by the way, in case you're wondering, I don't have any slides, in case you're like, when is this talk, when is this going to actually begin? But, um, <laughs> but you know, I actually used to start my, my presentations, especially about public health in Baltimore, with slides. And I used to show a map of our city. And I realized, actually, that there was almost no point to showing that map, because I could put anything in the legend, and it would be the same. As in, it's the same neighborhoods that have low life expectancy, that have high infant mortality, that have high overdose rates, that have high incarceration rates, that have low education, low socioeconomic, that, I mean, whatever you, we know as the social determinants of health could be portrayed in that map. 
And I actually also stopped showing that map because I got the feedback that we spend too much of our time admiring the problem and not enough time tackling solutions. And I think there is, I mean, I'm all for data. You know, I'm back in academia and I think it would not be taken very well if I'm here at GW saying that I don't believe in evidence and science and data, which of course I do. But I think there, the data reach a certain point of saying, we now need data on the interventions. We now need to be doing something and taking action and then measuring also the impact of those interventions too. But, you know, I say all of this because, well, to explain to you why I don't have any slides, so anticipation over for that. Um, but also that we are at a difficult time because in this backdrop, against this backdrop of so many disparities all throughout, no matter where we look and social determinants, it is the map of Baltimore, is the map of social determinants of health that even against this backdrop, we're actually seeing a lot of policies coming out that not only are not promoting healthcare and better access to health, but are detracting from them. And by the way, this is not a partisan talk. You might, you'll hear me say shortly about the Trump administration, but frankly, this is not a criticism of President Trump or Republicans or the administration. It's a criticism of the policies because that's my job. We have to be political and to talk about policies. The Affordable Care Act was mentioned in the Q&A before. We have to talk about policies because they impact our patients. But we don't have to be partisan in doing so. So political but not partisan. But I do want to talk for a moment about two examples of policies that I'm very concerned about affecting my patients. The public charge rule is one of them. You know, I am, I'm an immigrant. Let me ask how many of you in this room are immigrants or family of someone who's an immigrant? So quite a lot of you in this room. Well, my parents and I came to the U.S. just before I turned eight. And um, you know, I was talking to someone earlier about our immigrant story, and I think the typical immigrant story is an atypical one, right? And for us, I watched my parents really struggle working two, three jobs at a time. My father delivered newspapers, washed dishes in a restaurant, my mother cleaned hotel rooms, and they did that to make a better life for me and my little sister. Still though, despite them working as they did, they had to, they, we depended on Medicaid, we depended on children's health insurance program, we depended on food stamps, I went to public school throughout, we had housing that was subsidized. And you know, for us, when I now hear about the programs as being called entitlements, I think twice about this because for us, this was our survival. And I also don't know where we would be now if my family were forced to make some really unthinkable choices. My father, right after we first came, had a hemorrhaging stomach ulcer. And he went to the hospital and was taken care of in the ER. But I don't know what kind of choice we would have had to make if we had to decide between him getting care in that moment or the ability of our family to stay in the country in a few years' time. And it just, you know, I just worry that policies that deter people from seeking care will not only wor worsen health outcomes, and by the way, be more expensive later, but also what that will be doing, what that will do to widen our health disparities even more. Now, you all know, I'm sure, that reproductive health care is yet another area that is in a state of emergency. I mean, take the Trump administration's Title X gag rule that makes it harder for low-income women and families to receive basic health care like cancer screenings, STI and HIV testing, and birth control. Policies like that that take away access to care, the people they hurt the most are those who already bear the brunt of disparities. It's people of color, it's immigrants, it's families who already struggle to make ends meet. And frankly, it's the patients and communities that you and I are serving every day. And so in the setting of all of these public health threats and policy challenges, the question for us as health executives and administrators has to be, what can I do? And I know that I'm in a way preaching to the choir because all of you are here because you're doing something every day or you're taking this course and training because you want to be doing something every day. So I want to give three additional ideas for how we can be brave, how we can aspire to be visionaries to secure the future of healthcare access in America. And then I'm, I have plenty of, this is not a long talk, 
no slides. Um, and so I, I want to leave plenty of time for your questions and, um, and, and comments afterwards. And feel free to disagree and throw things my, 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 uh, my, my way to get my attention if you really disagree with something in the middle. But three ideas. The first is that we have to do whatever we can do right now. That we can't wait and let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So several years ago, when I was the health commissioner in Baltimore, there was a study done that found that up to 10,000 of our children needed something as basic as eyeglasses, but we're not getting them. And why not? Well, Maryland law requires for kids in public schools to get vision screenings in pre-K, first grade, and eighth grade. How many of you were diagnosed who, you know, I, I wear glasses, you can see, some of you wear glasses, many of you may wear contacts. How many of you were diagnosed with vision issues between first grade and eighth grade? A lot of you, probably most of us. And what we were finding through the study was that even those who were getting diagnosed through these vision tests were often not getting glasses. And we looked at the reasons why. It was because of lack of transportation, caregivers not being able to leave work, lack of insurance, or other social determinants that made something, frankly, as basic as eyeglasses unattainable. And so we at the health department worked with Johns Hopkins, Warby Parker, and multiple local and national groups to set up a program that provides, and still provides now, free eye exams and glasses to every child who needs them, right in their schools, so that they don't have to miss school, their parents and caregivers don't have to miss work. We ended up calling this program Vision for Baltimore, which, by the way, was not its first name. We'd actually asked for you know, other, um, our other staff and partners to come up with other names, and I'll give you some ideas of other contenders. Other contenders included glasses half full, <laughs> and my favorite, sight for sore eyes. <laughs> Vision for Baltimore it is. Um, you know, I remember though, the, um, you know, we had um, PBS coming and doing a story about our program, and I think they were looking for this perfect moment, you know, because, you know, this is a, television moment where a kid is receiving their glasses for the first time, and by the way, they also got to pick out their frames, so they got to, you know, they get to pick out the color of the frames, and it was kind of a made-for-TV moment, one would think, right? So this eight-year-old girl was receiving her new pink frames, and she put them on, and her teacher asked her if she saw any difference, and I think everyone was expecting this, aha, I can now see moment. She was not impressed. She said, no. So then the producer gave her a piece of paper to read, and first she read it without her glasses, and so she read it pretty slowly and haltingly. And then she put on her new glasses and read it. This time she read it at twice the speed with very little disfluency, and again, do you see any difference? And everybody was expecting, yes, but of course she said, no. <laughs> she was really not impressed. But what was interesting was the vision screener who had been working with the health department for over 20 years, while this was happening, had tears running down her face. Because she could see the difference that something as basic as a pair of glasses was going to make an impact on this child's life. I mean, you know, frankly, I don't need another study to tell me that if kids can't see, they can't read. Or if they can't read, and they may even be labeled as being disruptive, and be put back in school, another grade, and then another grade, when all they needed was a pair of glasses. And I think that, to me, is the power of public health, when a small intervention like that can change the trajectory of people's lives. And, you know, often we think about these high-tech solutions, and I'm all for high-tech solutions, too. But sometimes there are low-tech solutions, too. To meet people where they are, that makes this kind of difference as well. By the way, this also works for other health challenges. This idea of doing what you can now also works for other health challenges. When I first started as the health commissioner, this is back in 2014 when I was first announced, the number of people dying from opioid overdoses in our city was skyrocketing. And I came from the ER, so I knew the power of naloxone or Narcan, the opioid antidote. So if somebody is dying in front of me right now and is not breathing, I could give them Narcan and they would be revived and walking and talking literally within seconds. And to me, this was, if people are dying at unprecedented numbers, we should be giving them Narcan. 
So I worked with our state legislators to get, a, um, to get legislation passed so that I issued a standing order, which is a blanket prescription for naloxone to all 620,000 of our residents in Baltimore City. Which, by the way, even though I knew it was the right thing to do, writing a prescription for 620,000 people, writing your NPI number and your signature on that many prescriptions was still a little bit scary. <laughs> but we also discovered in doing this that policy change is necessary but not sufficient. Because you could have the best policies in the world, but if people literally don't know that it's there, or if our pharmacies didn't know about the standing order, how is anyone actually going to get this delivered to them? What's the point of all this? And so we also began doing the lock zone trainings in markets and churches and street corners. We mapped out where it is that overdoses were occurring and did outreach in real time. We hired people in recovery themselves because frankly, they are the most trusted messengers for getting that message out to people. And in three years, we conducted 39,000 trainings in our city. And as a result of these trainings, everyday people used naloxone to save the lives of nearly 3,000 family members, friends, and residents. Now, there are some people who have criticized that program and continue to criticize the program because they say that it is only a stopgap solution to the complex problem of addiction. And you know what, they're right. Because we have to do a lot more to address treatment. We have to do a lot more to address social determinants. We have to figure out what's really driving ill health and despair. But again, I come from the ER. And I know that if somebody is dead today, there is no hope for a better tomorrow. And while we are waiting for societal change, what is the change that we can be implementing right now? By the way, that's not to say that we should give up and not do these longer term things. Actually, it was also, we also began working on these other changes that I had long wanted to do in the ER. For example, getting treatment on demand, treatment to people when they need it. We started something called a stabilization center, which, is, which was my dream in the ER for all these patients who otherwise would go to the emergency department to get treated for addiction and mental health issues, but frankly, are not better served there. You all know what I'm talking about, right? They take up bed space, they end up waiting six hours, 12 hours to see a psych social worker, a counselor, when that's not the care that they need. They need specialized treatment somewhere, but not necessarily in the ED. We set up this pre-hospital diversion system in Baltimore so that patients can now go to the specialized center, freeing up space in the ED so the hospitals are happy, but I think as importantly, providing the right level of care to patients who need it. So you can do things like that and set up longer term systems. We set up levels of care in Baltimore City as well, working with 11, our 11 acute care hospitals to set up care in the same way that we have level one, level two, level three trauma centers. We set up levels of care for addiction and mental health treatment. So you can do all these things at the same time. But I think also not forget that there is something that we can do right now in order to save people's lives. And so that's just my lesson for how, you know, sometimes what we see are overwhelming. The problems that we see are overwhelming. But I think for us, no matter where we're coming from, whether it's management, whether it's consulting, whether it's experience on the ground, that we have to leverage these experiences and together we can move the needle on health outcomes, but we have to start somewhere. And it's our responsibility to say, what can I do from the vantage point that I have literally right now? as an analyst, as a healthcare administrator, as a manager, to be brave right now by being the person who steps up first and to ask what I can do now. That's my first idea. All right, the other two are a bit shorter. The second, we must recognize that improving health is an important goal, but alone it's not enough. That in our work, we have to also specifically call out reducing disparities and achieving health equity. So in 2009, in Baltimore, we had one of the worst infant mortality rates in the country. We had babies who were dying at the same rate as babies born in the middle of civil war in other countries in 2009. And also, an African-American baby born in Baltimore then, five times more likely to die in their first year of life than a white baby, 2009. So, you know, we said it's not enough just to improve infant mortality, 
without specifically addressing this really huge and unacceptable disparity. And so we led a public-private partnership that now involves over 150 partners in our city, from hospitals and insurers to neighborhood associations and churches. This program is called Be More for Healthy Babies, and it's got multiple components, including screening and triaging every pregnant woman on Medicaid, those who receive, who screen as needing the highest level of care may get a um, nurse home visitor throughout their pregnancy and postpartum. Others may have a social worker or a community health worker. And then patients, all, they all receive the full spectrum of resources from education on the ABCs of safe sleep to lactation support to free cribs. Although the free cribs, I think, is also a lesson about good intentions in and of itself because initially this program actually had no results. And in fact, the home visitors were noting that the baby was still sleeping in unsafe home environments, like co-sleeping or sleeping on a couch and you know, in the middle of cushions and other things. And why was that? They found that the crib was delivered in a flat pack and it remained in a cardboard box, unopened. So we began having someone physically go to the homes and make the crib. Another basic intervention that required going to people where they are that really makes all the difference. So as a result of all of these strategies, the home visiting, the triage, et cetera, through Be More for Healthy Babies, the infant mortality rate in our city dropped by 38% in seven years, which is equivalent to 50 babies that would have died in 2009 that in 2019 would be alive today. And another important result that we're even more proud of is that we also closed the disparity between black and white infant mortality by more than 50%. And I say all of this because, yes, we need to set the goal of improving health, but we should also be setting the goal, too, of specifically focusing on health equity. And we can never stop speaking out against the policies that disproportionately harm those who are already the most disadvantaged and the most vulnerable. There's a saying that the currency of inequality is years of life. And I believe that it's our duty and our obligation as leaders, administrators, executives, practitioners to tend to these pervasive inequalities and help to bend the arc of the universe back towards justice. All right, so first, in our courageous efforts to ensure a healthy future, we do what we can. We step up first. Second, we focus on equity. And now I'm gonna to get to the third part, which is that we fight forward and we meet new challenges with courage, integrity, and resilience. Now here I'm gonna share something very personal with all of you. And I hope that this is okay in this setting. I asked our coordinators in advance if it is, so you can talk to Dr. Bona or Dr. Friedman if you disagree, but you know, I wanted to talk to you all about my recent transition, because many of you know that about four months ago, I was asked to leave as the president and CEO of Planned Parenthood. And my termination was very public. And in fact, I found out about it because, you know, how, how many of you have those um, news alerts on your phone where a banner pops up and, you know, I, I have news alerts, I found out because a New York Times news alert popped up. And it was news about my own termination by the board of directors, which is, kind of traumatic and have actually disabled the news alerts on my phone subsequently. Um, but you know, this also came less than a month after I suffered a miscarriage, which had also become very public. And you know, while I did receive a lot of um, letters and, and, um, and offerings of support, in my previous role, you can imagine the type of vitriol that I received as well that I would really wish upon no one. Um, the last few months, I think you can imagine, have been a pretty difficult period for me. And in particular, I had come, as I think all of us do, to new jobs, right? I came to Planned Parenthood with all my dreams, all my hopes for the organization. I mean, I was a patient in Planned Parenthood. My mother was a patient in Planned Parenthood. I was, I was and am a physician who's very passionate about the reasons why I came, which is to reposition Planned Parenthood as a healthcare organization. I also saw the huge unmet need across my city, across our country, when it comes to reproductive health care and health care more broadly. And so that's what I came to do. And it was really an honor to lead this organization. The thing is, though, you know, I thought that the board was sending a clear signal 
with the direction that I had led Planned Parenthood and my leadership. Because on that day, not only did they terminate my employment, they also terminated the employment of my top deputies, which was very hard, I think, for all of us because we were trying to do these things like expanding programs and mental health and maternal health and you know, aiming to increase access, especially in rural and urban underserved communities. Things that we believed then and still believe now are really critical at this time in our nation's history. And I also felt like I was just letting down a lot of people, certainly the people that I brought on board with me who now not only can they not fulfill their vision, they also don't have jobs either. Now, I also thought that I was letting down a lot of people who I represented, who saw themselves in me in some way. I think we who are women and minorities are far from a common occurrence, unfortunately, when it comes to leadership. Even if we don't see ourselves that way, people look to us as examples, and for better or for worse, as symbols. I was the first Asian American to lead Planned Parenthood, an immigrant, and when I was first selected, I had been so heartened to hear from people all over the country, especially young people of color, who saw themselves in me in some way. And I'll also often talk about my experiences as a new mother. I have a son who's now two years old, Eli, and so many working women also see themselves in me as I do in them. And frankly, I felt like I was letting down all these groups that I represented in some way with my departure. You know, and again, I wasn't really sure that I wanted to talk about this experience in this talk today because we're supposed to be celebrating and talking about the future. But I also actually thought at the end that it's important for me to share this story, this most recent story, with our group of healthcare leaders and executives because we are laying out our visions for the future. And because so often in these discussions, in these circles where we talk about leadership, we hear so infrequently about people's setbacks and failures. But that is so instrumental to who we are as people and as leaders too. And what makes these setbacks so difficult is often that they could not have been predicted despite how we might have tried our best to chart our futures and predict. I mean, if you ask anyone here for your future plan, nobody's going to be writing down what failures they might have along the way. That's just not how we think about things. But I decided that I would be open with you today because I also believe that being brave to fulfill our goal of access and equity, these goals that we set for ourselves in our personal lives and our careers, that it also requires being vulnerable. And I think part of being vulnerable paving the path forward for others means facing the uncertainty about our own futures and being open about the obstacles that come along the way. And what's been an incredible source of wisdom and strength to me in the past several months have been the hundreds, maybe thousands of people who have reached out to me in different ways in the last several months. And I've heard a lot of, from friends and colleagues, but even total strangers tell me about their stories of job loss and in my case with pregnancy loss, who were so generous to be open and vulnerable with me. And I also heard from some of the people that I most admire, who are my mentors, who told me about their stories. I heard about, for example, the very public shaming of a former cabinet member, a forced resignation of a major hospital system CEO, and the combination of professionally difficult and personally tragic circumstances that to that person at the time really seemed like it was the worst thing that could ever happen. But what was so striking to me was not so much that they had these setbacks, but that as much as I had looked up to these mentors and even spoken extensively to them before, I wasn't aware of most of these stories. Which, by the way, in some cases is actually reassuring because it's testament to how we're not defined by a particular job or a particular setback, but by what we do and how we respond when that happens. Eleanor Roosevelt once said that you have to accept whatever comes, and the most important thing is that you meet it with courage and with the best that you have to give it. So as we fight forward with courage, with resilience, um, I think we also lead with passion and integrity, it is important for us to be vulnerable, and I urge for us to share our stories. Our stories of success for certain, because I think especially for, again, 
generalizing here, but especially for women and minorities, we don't tell those stories of success enough and we should help each other share these stories too with pride. But I would also urge for us to tell our stories of setbacks and failures too. After all, we cannot control the circumstances of our past, but we can choose how we will write our next chapter. So as for me, my next chapter, my current chapter, is to continue my life's work here. Um, uh, it's to serve women, children, and families, particularly those who are the most vulnerable. I'm glad to be here at GW, as you heard earlier through Kelly's introduction. I'm here as a visiting professor, teaching our nursing students, public health students, physicians, um, students at healthcare administration about health equity. And I'm also very grateful and very happy that my husband and I are now expecting again. And we look forward to our son, Eli, having a baby sister in March. <laughs> so I wanted to end today by giving some additional words from the late Congressman Elijah Cummings. Because Congressman Cummings often talked about the work that we do as so much bigger than us. That it's about our children and the generations yet unborn. And he would often refer to our children as the living messengers to a future that we will never see. And that the reason we do our work is because of the pain that we're channeling into our passion. That is our purpose. So healthcare professionals, advocates, and leaders, let's become the visionaries of our day. Don't wait, take action now. Turn your passion into your purpose, your purpose into your action, and go beyond fighting not only to improve health, but also to fighting against disparities and speaking up for equity and justice. Never hesitate to try and to fail, and then to have the courage and tenacity to look far and beyond your failure and persist and try again. And always hold true to our values and think not just about what we're fighting about, but who we're fighting for. So thank you, healthcare administrators and leaders and executives for what you are doing every day to advance and transform healthcare institutions around the country. Thank you to the GW Masters of Health Administration program for hosting this gathering today to strengthen our network so that we can together improve the lives of our patients and communities. I applaud you, I celebrate you as I fight together and serve together alongside you. Thank you. Dr. Wen, uh, first of all, congratulations to you and your husband and Thank your family. Thank you. I'm in need of a lot of hydration and <laughs> bathroom breaks these days. So, <laughs> um, I just want to say, um, also, thank you for, for being brave for us and being vulnerable to us. And as a GW community, as a family, that's so important. And so thank you so much. Um, there were so many things that you said. I've got a couple of questions, but I'm going to open it up to the floor to give you all a chance. And I know we have some microphones around, so please, does anyone have any questions? Hi, Dr. Nguyen. Um, thank you for being here um, in the first place for all of us. I know personally me, I personally very admire you and everything that you've done in women's health and everything, I personally have followed your story. And I know like in your past positions and roles, um, not a lot of people will agree with you or because not everyone's gonna agree with you. And I was just wondering what your strategy is to kind of maneuver through that, like how to do with other, it as an exec working with other people on disagreement and how you kind of just cope with that in general. Wonderful question. Thank you so much for mentioning it. And again, I'm going to refer to, um, to Paul Levy in his previous, um, in, in what he said earlier with public health. And I thought in particular what I really appreciated was what you said about empathy. And a core principle in public health, as all of you know, is meeting people where they are. And I actually worry a lot about this in today's political climate. And again, this is not a partisan issue at all. This is just an overall comment that so often we hear someone who disagrees with us or who uses different language than us and our first reaction is to attack and to say you're a racist or you don't get this or you, you know or, or whatever right that it just the first thing that comes out is this quite 
for lack of better words, violent reaction, which I really worry about because we're not gonna change anyone's minds that way. And in us doubling down on our own positions, that's not what leads to healing and progress. And I think that's the lesson that we have to take from public health and meeting people where they are. And in fact, this is what we do in healthcare as well. I mean, if, you know, if I'm giving a patient a difficult diagnosis and my first um, interaction, my first thought is to approach them with judgment, that's not fostering a good relationship. I mean, that's just not how we would approach our friends or a loved one. And so I think to your question, to approach people who have disagreements with us is to see what is that common ground and can we get to higher ground together? Did you always know that you were going to be a leader as a woman? No, and I'm not entirely sure that I know that now. I mean, to be honest, right? Like, I don't think I, um, no, just being very honest with you, it's just, uh, I mean, I had always pictured that I was, I was one of those really annoying people in medical school who, um, or not in medical school, but as a pre-med, when people were like, well, when did you know that you wanted to be a doctor? I've always mo known that I wanted to be a doctor. That's what I've always wanted to do was to take care of patients in their time of greatest need because I saw what happens when they don't have access to healthcare. And then everything else that happened after that was totally by coincidence. Um, as in, I didn't know about public health. I mean, I just didn't, it's not that I didn't think it was important, I just didn't know about it. Um, and yet I went into public health, or I didn't know about health policy, but I somehow ended up in it. And I certainly don't think that I'm meant to be a leader in, this, in that sense of the word, but I think it's something that you see the need and you go there. You know, I think about the saying that um, you don't, we cannot be waiting for the cavalry because the cavalry is not coming. That we are the ones that we've been waiting for. And I think that's true for all of us in this room. Hi, thank you for um, sharing and your transparency. Um, I like what you said because reading oh, Planned Parenthood, I'm a mom of eight and I'm like, ah. But I really was amazed by what you said and by being open, I just appreciate what you were trying to do um, at Planned Parenthood. So that leads to my question. Your relationship with the board, um, was your vision did they not agree with it? Or how could you use that experience also? So first question. And then how could you use that experience also to um, help some of the future executives yeah. with how to read the board or um, make sure you're on the same page, if at all possible? You know, it's a really important question. And um, let me answer it in um, a couple of ways. So the first is, you know, I don't, I would be the first to admit, as I am now, that I don't know that my strategy was the right strategy. How would I know? If we knew that ours was the right strategy, we would have solved the issue of healthcare access by now, right? I mean, I don't think that any of us can be like, we were right and the board was wrong, or I was right and this other person was wrong. So I don't, this is not what I'm saying at all. I'm just saying, here's what I went into Planned Parenthood doing. What I was very worried about um, was and still is the, politici the politicizing of women's reproductive health. And I thought that if Planned Parenthood is labeled solely as abortion and as abortion politics because of how divisive of an issue abortion is, and again, I'm not saying that's the right thing, but just that is where people are. If the country as a whole thinks of abortion politics as a divisive issue, even if we don't think it should be, if that's where they are, we need to lower the temperature, depoliticize, and try to look for common ground, which for me was about increasing women's healthcare access, um, looking at the comprehensive healthcare of which reproductive healthcare and abortion care is a part, and then looking to expand healthcare access in, in underserved communities, which because there is huge unmet need across the country. That was my strategy. And a lot of people agreed with that strategy, but a lot of people also disagreed. And I think, again, I'm not saying that I'm right and they're wrong. I'm actually acknowledging that there is a different and very legitimate point of view 
which is that at this time when reproductive rights are being attacked in a way like never before with Roe being threatened, with extremely restrictive and awful laws being passed around the country, that now is the time for us to double down on the fight for abortion rights. I actually think that that's a very legitimate strategy as well. I come to this as a healthcare provider and as a physician, you know, as a, as a healthcare, as a public health person, and so I don't see the world that way. But the fact that the board disagrees with that is not necessarily wrong. It's just that I think good people can disagree about strategy and none of us really know what is the right thing because we don't have our own counterfactual to live. You know, if it's anything that I can say about experiences and things that I learned um, along the way, I think it is that coming into an organization, coming into this organization in particular, I had thought that the conflicts that I would face would be 99% of my time would be spent fighting them externally because of the rhetoric that's happening around this, around this very divisive issue. What I did not expect, and I'm not sure that I would have known to even ask this question in advance, but I now know, so to your second question, lessons for us all, is how much is there alignment on the vision internally? And I did not realize how divisive of an issue this was initially and how the two different camps remain to this day still very much divided. And I think that's an important, and I'm not saying that that means there's something wrong with the organization, it just means that that's a different set of challenges that you would be walking into on day one as the leader if you know that there isn't alignment on vision and that's what you have to do. I did not understand that that was my goal, that that was what I was brought in to do. I thought that everybody had agreed and I'm being brought in as the leader to reposition us as opposed to somehow trying to close the internal gap. And that's certainly something that I'll take with me as I hope that you'll take with you too. So in your fight forward, thinking about your passion and what you're here to do, beyond the board, beyond Planned Parenthood, how do you look at the future and instead of looking for a seat at the table, building your own? I love that, and I actually use that exact language when talking about public health, too, because, and again, referring to um, Paul's excellent speech, I think that so often public health is forgotten as a partner. And frankly, he, we know why, because public health works when something did not happen. <laughs> when, I mean, there is, you know, we consider restaurant inspections to be a success when there are no cases of food poisoning. And there's the face of someone who was food poisoned, but not the face of all these people who could have gotten food poisoning, except they didn't because of the thousands of inspections that we did, right? Or the, there's a case of somebody who was lead poisoned, but what about all those kids who were not lead poisoned because of the home remediation that was done or because they were never exposed in the first place? So I think this is always a challenge for those of us in prevention and public health, because how do you make the case for something that didn't happen but could have and if we don't make that case, if we don't put the face on public health, then we will be the first thing on the chopping block. And if we're not at the table, we're on the menu. So I really believe that for those of us, especially who are going into fields that are not as widely acknowledged yet, or that are marginalized in some way, I mean, I would love to see public health actually bringing people together, but I think also it tends to be the one that's forgotten a lot of the time on whatever issue, environment, you know, climate, immigration, whatever other issue ties to public health, but that lens may often be forgotten. So I really agree with what you're saying, that you can't be waiting for an invitation, that we have to be the ones saying, demanding a seat at the table, or even we are the ones who are convening that table to begin with. And I think for me, recognizing that huge unmet need for public health is exactly my next chapter, which is to advocate using what I think is a powerful voice of public health, because frankly, standing with the public, with the public's health, always means that we will be standing on the right side of history. I think we might have time for one more well, how about, question. Let's do both of these and I'll answer them together. How about that? So well, then I can get you too. All right. I, I just, I love it when people, when people raise their hands to ask questions, so thank you both get too. Hi, um, thank you for being here. So uh, sorry if you already touched on this topic before, but 
I was wondering, how do you think a healthcare administrator can best make an impact in an organization that's public health oriented, such as Planned Parenthood? I know like a lot of in, um, administrators like to go into acute care and other areas, but if they're looking to go into you know Planned Parenthood or something like that, um, how do you think they can best make that impact? Mm. Okay, and I'll take this question, your question also. I was gonna say what you said about immigrant health uh, pretty much hits home and I was previously a case manager for social services. I remember one of my clients said, you know, what's gonna happen, this was back in 2015, what's gonna happen if when Trump goes into office, what's gonna happen to my benefits? And I said, well, I don't know. And thinking about the public charge rule now um, with a lot of those um, issues going on, how do you see as um, healthcare administrators for hospitals, what are some issues that strategically leaders can do to mitigate those issues um, focused on immigrant health? Mm, wow, both really excellent questions. And I think related in some ways because, you know, I, I have trouble offering an exact, like here's what you can do right now, because I think it depends on whatever vantage point that you have right now. And so if you're in a position to make a difference on immigrant health, I mean, I'm just, you know, just giving some random examples here, right? There are hospitals that may not have the best practices when it comes to billing. And maybe there's something that you can do to help with surprise medical billing or other practices that may help to reassure patients that they are welcome, that they're not going to have ICE coming after them if they came. Maybe there's community outreach that the hospital is already doing to partner with a nonprofit in the community to reassure patients or to deliver services to the community. I mean, I think there are endless examples, but it's meeting people where they are with the, with the vantage point that you have at this point in time. And I think that vantage point to the other, to your other question, um, really depends on what you are willing to do and your level of power at that time. And I really think that so often people make the mistake of saying, well, let me wait until I have this position of power. Let me wait until I have this perfect position, until I have this next, you know, until I'm at the SVP level or whatever level. But I don't think you need to wait until then because there will be a lot that you're able to do by pushing, you know, I'm a big fan of this leadership of meta leadership. And I love that concept because it's saying that everybody really is able to make a difference, that you need to be, you're always, you're not just leading down, you're leading up, you're leading around, you're leading all around you. Um, and I think that that's, if it's any takeaway for today, it's that there's something that we can do right now and that we should not wait. So I think that was our last question, but I just wanted to say thank you all.